Uncle Ned took my hand. Thanks for coming, Silas, he said. I tried my best to hold back my tears. Ned was my last living relative, and he was dying. His doctor had told me the news in the small hallway at the end of the intensive care unit a few minutes earlier. Uncle Ned and I have always been close. He was my mother's brother, and to me, he was like a second father. Two years ago, as I watched my mother's coffin being lowered into the grave, Ned hugged me and said, She's in a better world, son. Now it was just Ned and I, and he knew it was his turn. Since he got sick, I have been coming to the hospital every day. He thought I was coming for him, but now I understand that I am coming for myself. Today he had a conversation with the doctor and he said that he needed to come early because he urgently needed to talk to me. I was going to come anyway. I'll just be a little earlier, I said. When I arrived, Ned said in a voice that was getting weaker, I need to talk to you about money for pins. Money for pins was something of a family legend. They started with my great-grandfather, Silas, my namesake, whose father was a lawyer. But Silas wanted to become a farmer. His father was against it. But young Silas kept chickens behind the wealthy family's house. This embarrassed the wealthy family a little. Silas sold eggs and saved money. When Silas turned 20, his father called it quits and said he'd had enough of chickens. If Silas refuses to pursue what his father considers a suitable profession, he will be cut off from the family wealth. The father did not know that Silas made significant money by selling eggs. Silas left home and started working on a farm. He was so successful in this matter that he reconciled with his family. Having gained independence, Silas always put money from selling eggs into a special fund. He eventually gave this money to my grandfather as a sort of trust for future generations of the family. My grandfather had two children, my mother, Sonia, and my uncle, Ned, to whom he entrusted the money for the pins, as they were called. Whenever there were financial problems in the family, my mother and uncle Ned would say, let's use the money for pins, and then they would laugh hysterically. Perhaps it was because of this laughter that I perceived money for pins as some kind of joke. Ned was a lawyer, like his grandfather, Silas's father. However, Ned always lived very frugally in a small house with very modest needs. He never married, often saying that he would marry when he found a woman as good as his mother or sister, but I don't think he ever found one. Uncle, I said, if there's nothing in the pin fund, I don't care. I'm here for you, not for money. I know, that's why I called you. You're getting married to Nancy next month, and, as good as she seems and as beautiful as she is, there's something about her that I can't trust. They say you don't know your spouse until you've been married a long time, Ned said, and then paused before continuing. At home in my desk, you will find the will and all the information about the Silas Stevenson Family Trust. Please don't tell your wife about this until you are completely confident in her and have been married to her for at least five years. Promise me this, and I will go to eternal rest in peace. What was I supposed to do? I gave my uncle the word he was seeking. I thought it was a small, unimportant matter. I was about to see that I was very wrong. I stayed with my uncle for another hour. During this time, he seemed to have fallen asleep. But then the monitors began to squeal and buzz. My Uncle Ned left to join my mother and his mother. Three days later, I buried my uncle in the family plot next to my mom and dad. There, in a small cemetery outside Masena, their parents were there, as was the rest of the family. Nancy, my fiancé, didn't come to the funeral. She had her final exams. Nancy was then a fourth-year medical student. Nancy and I were together for about two years. She and Uncle Ned could never get along. Nancy can be a little hostile. She is very purposeful. From her school years, she was focused on becoming a doctor, and for this, she made many sacrifices. This made her a bit socially repressed. She is pretty, some might even say beautiful, height five feet six inches, shoulder-length blonde hair. She has the body of a cheerleader but the personality of a geek. She wasn't the best at math, which is why we met. In college, I tutored people who were struggling with advanced math. 
Nancy was assigned to me. She needed good grades to get into medical school, and that meant not just passing advanced math, but doing it very well. Somehow, we just hit it off. My goal was teaching. We both wanted to help others. Neither of us had much relationship experience. We started what I would call study dates. We got together for classes and finished them in a cafe. Gradually, they began to squeeze each other on the way home. The evening I received the news of my mother's death, I was with Nancy. The next day, I asked her to marry me. But we postponed the wedding until I graduated from university and found a teaching job. A week after Ned's funeral, I opened my uncle's desk drawer and discovered that he had left me a great burden. There, neatly laid out, were his last will and the documents of a trust of which I was the sole beneficiary. Monthly statements from banks and brokers spoke for themselves. The Stevenson Family Trust contained almost $7 million. Nancy and I lived together for several years while she finished college. I received my teaching diploma, and the wedding was planned for next month. I had to support Usan my teacher's salary while she completed her studies. She had a long way to go because she wanted to become a surgeon. The money I inherited would make life easier, but I promised to keep it secret. Plus, I saw the pin money as a kind of personal commitment that should be passed on to our children. I didn't tell Nancy about the trust fund, but instead took the money to an investment company in Manhattan. If we needed something, I would take money from the fund, always giving the impression that I had borrowed the money and was trying my best to pay it back, which was true to some extent. I intended to return the money to the trust as quickly as possible. Her parents gave us a wonderful wedding, but I refused their offer to pay for the honeymoon. I took us to an expensive Caribbean resort, telling Nancy that Uncle Ned had bequeathed funds to me for our honeymoon, and it was true. For the first few years of our marriage, I saw Nancy very rarely. She seemed to be constantly learning, but when we were together, life was good, very good. My career has ultimately kept me very busy. I was a public school teacher in an upscale community where I taught second grade. With my math background, I could teach in high school and even graduate and become a college professor. However, my aspirations were aimed at making a difference in the lives of my students. My heart told me that the best way to do this is to teach young children. Nancy did not understand the nature of my calling, but she initially accepted it. As I already said, when she was studying at the Faculty of Medicine and I was teaching small children, we were very happy. I looked forward to the fact that someday we would have our own children. Eventually, Nancy graduated from university and interned at a local medical center. I went from seeing her too rarely to almost never seeing her at all. However, I understood that she was working towards a goal, and I believed that when her internship ended, we would truly be together. However, she soon went to residency. Before I knew it, we had already been married for five years. It was time to tell Nancy about the pin money, but something was holding me back. I knew I had to tell her, but something made me remain silent. Finally, I admitted to myself that I didn't trust my wife. She was ambitious and all too aware of her position in society. I told myself that in time she would grow up and then I would be able to solve the mystery of the pin money. Nancy completed her residency and began her career as a surgeon. I thought that we would see each other more often, but this did not happen. However, Nancy's income increased significantly, and soon she was talking about buying a house. I took this as a good sign that we were planning to have children. Nancy insisted on buying an expensive house in a fashionable area, which, in her opinion, would correspond to her new, inflated status. I am a surgeon, she told me, and this is the home of a successful doctor. The house was a classic mansion, occupying too much land and having an interior design that created a lot of wasted space. The house had a detached three-car garage, which Nancy soon filled with an expensive luxury car and a four-wheel drive all-terrain vehicle. Our little Subaru, which I drove, was squeezed into third place. My suggestion that it was time to think about children was abandoned. We have just gained freedom. Children will bind us. It's time to enjoy our success, she countered. However, we did not enjoy freedom, at least not me. I spent many lonely nights and weekends in a big empty house. 
We lived in a postcard neighborhood where the houses are close, but the people are far apart. Nancy supposedly didn't work nights or weekends, but I began to suspect there was more to it than just work. Out of Boridome, I started working weekends at a local daycare center and spending my nights chatting on the internet. It was this last activity that led to the strange development of events. I used to attend education-oriented groups where we would discuss current trends in the field. One evening, a newbie showed up with an unusual and very specific question. This is Hermes, he wrote. Does anyone know of an educational program called Doctrina? I would be interested in your thoughts. The chat room I was in that evening consisted mostly of school administrators. They heard about the educational program he mentioned. It was a complex package of computer programs for primary school children, about which much was written in the press at the time. Most of the administrators present in the chat that evening were absolutely delighted. However, it turned out that my school became a testing ground, and I knew that the program was useless. Technologies, I commented. This is all very good, but the doctrine requires large investments in equipment for almost all schools. Even in the most affluent schools, there are only one or two computers for each junior class. Using this software product requires large investments to achieve modest success. This excludes public and all but a few elite private schools. However, if you're spending a small fortune on your child's private school education, do you want a machine teaching them? What about homeschooling? asked Hermes. I had thoughts on this matter, and soon he offered to chat in a private chat. We spent the next four hours discussing Doctrina's chances of success in the field of education. It was already two o'clock in the morning when we passed out. However, my wife was still not at home. She arrived around three and stumbled into our bedroom. I pretended to be asleep. She had clearly been drinking and was therefore not working. She threw her clothes into the laundry basket and headed to the bathroom off the bedroom. Before leaving for work the next day, I checked the laundry basket. Nancy was still sleeping. Supposedly, she worked the four to midnight shift. But I had my doubts. The clothes in the basket weren't the kind you'd wear to work, especially the fashionable underwear, which was stained with traces of sex. All the faith I had in my wife was lost. I walked around in a fog for the next two weeks, wondering what had become of my life and trying to determine its future course. Something went wrong? Is it something I did or didn't do? Was it one man or many? Should I talk to her openly? Should we try seeing a psychologist? There were so many questions, but no easy answers. Little Jeffrey Anderson brought me out of this state. He was a smart boy, but he had a hard time. He had obvious problems with reading and diction. I suspected he had a learning disability. Our school did not have adequate testing facilities. We carried out testing, but it was purely routine. I knew his parents had resources, so I told them about my suspicions at a parent-teacher conference and recommended several reliable sources that could help them. As it turns out, Jeffrey had a problem and needed more help to overcome it. Jeffrey's help could take my mind off the problems in my marriage. At the end of the assessment and intervention meeting, Mr. and Mrs. Anderson thanked me. Mrs. Anderson hugged me and said, You are a wonderful person. Your wife is a very happy woman, although she doesn't seem to understand it. Mrs. Anderson is a nursing supervisor at the hospital where my wife works, and her husband is a prominent lawyer. Then Jack Anderson shook my hand and said, If you ever need anything, Silas, please don't hesitate to ask. I left feeling like a giant. I was at the top of my profession. At this point, I received a mysterious text message from Hermes asking me to come to the discussion forum late that evening for a private conversation. The next text message was from my wife, telling me that she would be late again that evening. I went to the message board at about 11 o'clock in the evening. Hermes was already waiting for me there. Hey, teacher, he began. I owe you. That deal with doctrine fell through. You saved me a lot of money, I'm glad, but is that what you do? Investments? Yes, I started out as a day trader with family money, but I almost lost it all. However, I met this guy who runs a fund that invests in startups. I've been investing with him for about three years now. He doesn't always hit the target, but when he hits, it's good money. He pushed this doctrine, 
until I enlightened him. He is grateful for the help you gave us. Happy to help. Listen, my friend and I have discussed this, and we have an immediate proposal. If you're interested, I can give you part of my option. The minimum option is $500,000. i will give you part of mine, any amount you want, up to $5,000, he said. Well, I guess I could invest some of the fun money into pins, I typed. Ha ha, money for pins is good. I didn't know this guy other than on the message board, but that evening something nudged me. I was on top of success with Jeffrey Anderson and at the bottom of the abyss because I felt that Mrs. Anderson knew what my wife was doing behind my back. You know, friend, I wrote, I'll come in, but I want a full share. 500,000. Seriously? You are a teacher? Like I said, I have money for pins. Pins? Who would have thought? But what is the name of this company? The company is called Odeo, but we are investing in its subsidiary. They call it Twitter. Yes, I understand. Stupid name. The title was very stupid, but I think you understand what happened. I got involved in something I had no idea about. If Hermes had explained what it was, I would, of course, pass by. In my opinion, using such a stupid name was a stupid idea. This was going to be the first of several stupid ideas. Sometimes they failed, but when they succeeded, the payoff was great. Five years after purchasing Twitter, I watched my wife from across the ballroom. Nancy and I's relationship began to decline. This time we were at a fundraiser and holiday party for the hospital. Everyone was in formal clothes except the teacher. I was in my best blue suit and felt my wife's embarrassment. For her part, she hung on the arm of the young surgeon, her last lover. Soon the dancing would begin and she would be in his arms, dancing too close for it to be proper. I should have been concerned, but divorce was definitely on the cards. The problem was that I was too rich at the moment. I was richer than any man has any right to be. I hid my wealth, but I couldn't figure out how it wouldn't come out in the divorce and disrupt my life. Such was the strange confluence of circumstances that led me to this place in my life. I secretly used the pin money for good causes, but was careful not to reveal my ownership of the money. However, fate has not yet finished with either money or me. Mr. Stevenson, the woman said, taking my hand. I turned my attention from watching my wife and saw Mrs. Anderson standing next to me. Oh, hi, Mary, I said. I should have guessed you were here. Congratulations on your appointment as director of nursing. Thank you, and if you don't mind, I'd like to introduce you to a few people. She led me to a small group. You know my husband, Jack, and this is Leslie Dumont, the president of our hospital. Her husband, Arthur, and Donna. Miller, I said, interrupting her. We are old acquaintances, Mary turned to Donna. Oh, do you know Mr. Stevenson? Yes, Donna said. Silas is a volunteer at the kindergarten that I use. I'm afraid I forced myself on him several times as a travel companion, being late for a meeting. Donna was a short woman with a round figure, not exactly fat, but with wide hips and voluminous breasts. Like the old drawings of sexy forest nymphs I thought when I saw her for the first time. I was mesmerized by her silky black hair, cut short and framing her beautiful round face. At the kindergarten where I volunteered, she had two children. She was a registered nurse at a hospital, working on weekends to avoid night shifts. She lacked help at home because her husband had died two years earlier. Weekend daycare is very limited and difficult to maintain due to decreased demand and significant costs. Our daycare was open seven days a week thanks to a grant from a mysterious foundation oddly named the Pin Fund. It never hurts to help a beautiful woman in need, I said, earning laughter from the group and a shy, embarrassed smile from Donna. Here lawyer Jack Anderson entered the conversation saying, Very well said, and obviously true, since it comes from the best teacher I know, someone who is dedicated to excellence. Now it was my turn to blush in embarrassment, but Mary Anderson immediately began explaining to Donna and Mr. and Mrs. Dumont how I had noticed Jeffrey's learning problems and helped develop an intervention plan for him. Jeffrey is going to high school next year, and thanks to this man, he's at the top of his class, she said, leaning over and hugging me. Perfection in our profession is something we all strive for, but few of us achieve, noted Arthur Dumont. Mrs. Dumont then added, 
However, some allow themselves to be controlled by their base nature. As she spoke, Leslie Dumont looked across the room to where my wife had begun to dance with her new lover. I did not believe that my wife's activities were entirely secret, but it seemed at the time that she was much more widely known than I had believed. At this point, Donna said, I'm going to take the plunge and ask this fine gentleman to dance. That's how I first held Donna Miller in my arms, a woman who, from that moment on, seemed to perfectly fill the space between my arms and the emptiness in my life. I drove Donna home that evening, leaving my wife to make her own way to the house we sometimes shared. Donna lived in a small house cut into a hill on a side street. She invited me to have coffee. I watched her lovingly check on her children sleeping in their cribs. She then paid the young girl sitting with them, taking money out of a small purse in her handbag. When she gave the girl the money, her wallet was empty. I once again noticed how often there is a difference between domestic happiness and financial well-being. We sat in her kitchen until the morning and drank coffee. I pushed her to tell me about her life. She talked about her childhood and nursing school, and then how she met her husband and fell in love. She talked about how she gave birth to first a son and then a daughter. All this flowed out of her like a spring river rushing to the sea. Then the dam broke, and she quietly told me about the tragic death of her husband. She and the children were in the car with him on their way to visit his elderly mother when a truck crashed into them, killing him and injuring her. Luckily, the kids were safe in the back seat, but Jason died and I spent three weeks in the hospital. The truck belonged to some corporation that had little insurance. The payments for Jason soon dried up due to our living expenses that first year. She tried to hush up the difficulties she faced after her husband's death, but I didn't let her. Made her tell me everything, knowing that telling her would lighten her burden. I don't know what I would do without the subsidized kindergarten that the center where you work provided me, she said. I wonder how they managed to do this. Oh, you know, I said, people like me donate a little time, and parents like you help. In addition, we have philanthropists. Yes, I'm very grateful to you, she said, covering my hand with hers and squeezing it. And I am very grateful to this Bulavok Foundation. I should write to them and tell them how much they have helped me and how grateful I am to them. Oh, I'm sure they know that. Well, I'd still like to tell them, she said. Could you give me their address? I'll work on it, I said. But it's very late, and it's time for me to go. I think you're wrong, she smiled. In fact, it's very early now. But I'll let you go if you promise to come back and tell me everything about yourself and not let me do all the talking like I did last night. I made that promise and actually intended to return. That evening, my wife was waiting for me at home. She was furious and fighting, but I had no reason to give her what she wanted. Listen, I'm tired, and no matter what you say, I'm going to bed. Oh, no, you're not going. You can't just leave me without a word at a public event. How do you think it was for me to get home? I was expecting your boyfriend to take you home. I said, giving her a look that I hoped meant I knew about her extramarital affairs. How dare you throw such accusations? As I already said, I'm tired, and this is not an accusation but a fact known to most, if not all, of your colleagues. You and, I think his name is Dr. Anthony Vincent, have been very public for months. You flaunted it in front of your colleagues tonight. Tony is a friend, and that's all. Well, I suppose it's yours. Another gave you a ride home. If you understood anything, you would know that Tony rides a motorcycle, and that's not what I was dressed for. Nancy, I sighed, can't you understand that I don't care anymore? Why? I'm guessing you have something going on with that bitch you left with tonight. With these words, I turned around sharply. She almost fell down the stairs, not expecting me to bump into her. Donna Miller is not a bitch. She is a widow and mother, a decent woman who people like you cannot understand. She didn't expect me to protect Donna, and as she grabbed the railing to keep from falling, I saw something appear on her face, a mixture of fear and loss. But then she returned her anger, and when we reached the top of the stairs, she said, You hate me because of my success. At the door to our bedroom, I turned to her again, not with anger, but with curiosity. 
Why do you think that I hate you? I asked. Because I am an outstanding surgeon and you are an unimportant schoolteacher. I could only shake my head as I walked into the bedroom and got ready for bed. Apparently she thought she had earned a point with her last statement. It's all mine, you know, she asserted. The house and everything in it. The Mercedes and the SUV, the money in the bank accounts, and our 401k are all on my income. But not the money in the pins fund. Not a single dollar came from her from the tens of millions of the fund, which earned more in a week than she did in a year. She also could not claim full ownership of the rest of our property, acquired with my teaching salary. However, I only felt disappointment that she put things before love in our marriage. Why, Nancy? I asked. How can you be so obsessed with material things? As I said this, I thanked Uncle Ned for his advice. I kept the money for the pins a secret because I couldn't trust my wife. I walked into the master bedroom bathroom and closed the door behind me. Nancy first tried the door and then shouted through it. During the divorce, I will make sure that you don't get anything. Then, thank God, she calmed down. She wasn't there when I finished in the bathroom and went back to the bedroom. I shrugged my shoulders and went to bed. The day after Thanksgiving, Nancy essentially drove a knife into our marriage. We spent the holiday at her parents' house, and my Nancy pretended that we were a loving couple. When the food was served and her mother finally sat down at the table, the first words from her mouth that all family members heard were, Silas, when can I see my grandchildren? Ask your daughter, I replied. Nancy gave me an angry look and then launched into her standard response about how we should wait until her career was more successful. At the end, her mother gave her standard advice that we shouldn't wait too long. The next day, Nancy assured us that we had waited too long. I'm leaving for the Christmas holidays, she told me. And where do you suggest we go? I asked. Not for us, she said. I'm going with a friend. This is a male friend, I believe. None of your business, she hissed. Well, it's not Tony Vincent, because I heard that he left you for a younger model. She became furious and ran out of the house. I sat for a while and then decided to call the travel agency. Yes, I can book this trip, the woman told me. But I must warn you that during the Christmas week, it can be very expensive, and this does not include entrance fees to the park and attractions. Just place the order, but don't make a final commitment until the woman says yes, I told her. I've seen Donna quite often over the past year. He often invited her and the children to dinner when she came to pick them up from kindergarten on weekends. The children already knew me well. They are Darrell, six years old, and Cheyenne, four years old. Darrell was named after his paternal grandfather, and Cheyenne was named after his mother, Donna. Although Donna and I became close, there was no physical connection. It's not that I was holding back for some false moral reasons. As far as I knew, I owed nothing to Nancy or our marriage. But I felt a conflict within Donna. The good wife was still trying to recover from her husband's death. It was in this spirit that I asked Donna and her children to come with me to Disneyland in Florida during Christmas week. First, he proposed to Donna, doing it in the absence of children. She initially refused. Do you think this is reasonable? She asked. If you're worried about my wife, then don't be. She said that she would be vacationing with a friend. No, that's not my concern, Donna said. I was thinking about expenses. Well, don't worry. I have money set aside for such occasions. When we told the kids about this, they were delighted. But it occurred to me that Donna already knew that my wife would not be a problem. I had to find out what she knew. I did something else. I called and hired a private investigation firm, large and with resources, to follow my wife during her trip. Again, they reminded me of the costs, and I assured them that this was not a problem. How about I send you a deposit of $25,000 and you bill me weekly? Having arranged surveillance for my wife, I prepared for the end of the school semester and vacation. For the first time in many years, I was looking forward to Christmas. We flew to Orlando on Christmas Eve. Traveling with two small children was tiring. The room I booked had two large bedrooms, and Donna shared one of them with her children. I slept alone on a double bed. Early on the morning of Christmas Day, the children woke us up, 
hurrying to go. We spent the day on the rides and wandering around the park. However, by late evening, everyone was exhausted. It was a hectic day at the park, but I was hoping the crowds would ease up by the end of the trip. Shortly after an early dinner, first Cheyenne and then Daryl fell asleep. I opened a bottle of wine from room service, and Donna and I settled into the couch. Donna took a sip and then took her leave. I decided that she was tired and was going to bed. Donna returned wearing a simple, short baby doll nightie. I was stunned and barely managed to stammer. What the heck? Oh, don't you like it? She teased, straightening her hem and twirling around a little. When I first saw her, I thought she looked a little like a classic sexy nymph. But after seeing her like this, I realized that she is the sexiest nymph ever. When she finished her little pirouette, I jumped up and hugged her. The sex that follows is beyond description. There seemed to be no end to our passion, and this is because it was not just passion. Each of us knew that the other fell in love without even having sex. We have moved to that state of physical intimacy that many strive for but few achieve. Early in the morning, exhausted, we lay in each other's arms, and I asked, Why now, Donna? Because, she answered, I love you. I wanted you for a long time and knew that you wanted me. But you respected him and me enough to wait. I knew that the one she was talking about was her dead husband. Afterwards, we slept, and only later, almost on the last day, sitting in a small cafe and drinking overpriced coffee, I asked what she knew about my wife's new friend. Her children were playing nearby. She watched them and did not look at me as she spoke. This is Dr. Sherman and I'm afraid it will be a bit of a scandal. Isn't it Thomas Sherman, chief physician of the hospital? Yes, she answered. The same Thomas Sherman. But he's happily married and must be at least 15 years older than Nancy, I objected. More like 20, and there are rumors that he was just having an affair with a younger woman until his wife caught him in bed with her and kicked him out. Now they say he's trying to look good. However, no one believes that he will last long with the hospital slut, she expressed her opinion. Then, realizing exactly what she had said about my wife, she turned to me with a burning face and apologized. Don't worry, she is exactly that and more, I admitted. I didn't want to go home, but I knew we had to. We arrived home on New Year's Eve, just in time to celebrate the ball drop in Times Square. I didn't go home that night, but stayed at Donna's. My wife returned the next day, just an hour after I arrived. She looked good and tanned, obviously from a holiday in the sun. I think her own tan prevented her from noticing mine. At least we didn't exchange a kiss of greeting. The cool atmosphere continued between us until February, when I came home from school to find her sitting in our living room. I knew what her problem was. He continued to follow her. Word of the affair between the head physician and the surgeon reached the hospital trustees, and one of the lovers had to leave. They chose her. She wanted me to console her, but it was difficult for me to do so. She also tried to win me back. However, as they say, the ship has sailed. In April, my marriage to Nancy ended abruptly. I waited for her to get back on her feet professionally before asking for a divorce. Her return to her calling was not easy for her. Hospitals in our region knew about her reputation and wanted nothing to do with her. Finally, she found a position at a small hospital that specializes in bariatric weight loss surgery to survive the current healthcare climate. The chief surgeon was a woman, and Nancy became her assistant. I assumed that this was a significant reduction in prestige, but perhaps not in salary. Anyway, it all blew up because of something on my part. At first, Donna and I tried to take precautions. After returning from Florida, Donna began taking pills, or more accurately, some kind of patch. I don't know enough to understand what went wrong, but she got pregnant and my happiness knew no bounds. Since she worked at the hospital, the news quickly got out. One afternoon I returned home from school, intending to change clothes and head to Donna's. Nancy was waiting for me there. Well, you got the little girl pregnant, she accused me. I just shrugged and replied, Yes, and we are very happy. As I expected, this pissed Nancy off, and she started calling Donna and me names. When she calmed down a little, I said as calmly as possible, 
this should be no more humiliating for you than your status as a noble libertine is for me. But if you want to ease the pain, then I suggest you divorce me as soon as possible. You're a bastard, she cursed. You're not even ashamed. As for me, I have nothing to be ashamed of. I will report adultery and call the little mother your mistress. No, you won't, I laughed. You see, I have photographs. I've been following you since Christmas before last. I especially like the set of photos of you and Tom Sherman at the nudist beach in St. Martin. If they get on the internet, then whatever reputation you have left will evaporate. You wouldn't dare, she said. Try. Then I left and went straight to Jack Anderson's office. He had been waiting for me for quite some time. Sitting in his office, he said, You understand that she will demand everything. She can get everything except the money for the pins, but it's clear that I want to do it quickly, I said. She won't be able to reach the trust with pins. It is irrevocable, and you followed my advice to transfer your financial income into it gradually over time, Jack replied. Okay, let's do this. Donna was not so optimistic. How can you give her everything? You have to fight it. I'll lend you money for lawyers. I can take out a second mortgage on this house. I don't care about my reputation. But I won't let you go broke because of me. I took with me a bottle of expensive champagne. Let me pour you a glass. You'll probably need it, I said. She was sitting at the kitchen table and stood up to stop me. No, she demanded. I'm pregnant and we can't afford it. Just one glass, I said, gently pushing her into a chair. When I sat her down and poured some wine into her, I got down on my knee and said, Donna Miller, would you agree to marry me? And then I'll tell you about the money for the pins. She frowned, but nodded her head in agreement to my proposal, muttering, Money for pins, that's true. And I started telling her, it all started with my great-grandfather Silas. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.